Following the talks by surgeon, philosopher, and lawyer, now we have the last, but certainly not the least, perhaps the most important talk given by Dr. Deckford Lump. Uh, Dr. Lump, he studied medicine uh, in Germany, also he had an MBA in, uh, from Hong Kong. He worked in the hospital in Germany, and then he has been working in the medical insurance field over 30 years. So now he's been a uh, chief underwriter Asia, uh, uh, life and health at Swiss insurance uh, based in Hong Kong. He's been a fellow, a board member for many, many uh, professional organizations for the insurance medicine. So today he's going to give a talk. I think it's quite rare and very uh, previous to have him here at the ethic workshop. So he's going to give a talk about the insurance aspect of the patient doctor interaction. Thank you, Dr. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction, Anders, and thank you for the invitation. I want to look at the impact or potential impact that insurance can have on the interaction between patient and doctors. Now, as Andrew said, I'm, I'm not a practicing physician. I'm not an academic either. Uh, the only time I practice uh, is similar to Professor Kumta when there is this sort of, here's, here's, the, here's the captain speaking. Is there a doctor on board? Then, then I, I killed it. Um, then, then I, is that still working? Good. Then I'm, I'm obviously get out of my seat and, and in addition to all these difficult questions that you're confronted with, my personal problem is that usually by the time this call comes, I had a glass of wine or two or even a scotch. And that doesn't help exactly with the decision making. So um, um, the, the, the relationship between uh, clients and, um, uh, sorry, with, uh, between patients and doctors is clearly influenced by external factors. And one of these external factors is indeed insurance. So I can't help uh, now seeing this relationship through the doctors. Now, insurance is often depicted or symbolized as an umbrella, an umbrella that opens when unpleasant things happen in your life, Desires, disaster strikes, strikes. That is when the umbrella is there. But we all know, right, when it's raining hard enough, we still get wet feet. Regardless of how good the umbrella is, how big the umbrella is, we get wet feet. And when some other factors come along, like strong wind or so, this umbrella becomes bloody useless and we get wet. So what I'm trying to say is insurance is just one factor in maybe the system uh, that Dr. Campbell talked about. Um, it's one factor only, and there must be much more factors going right to protect the patient's rights and the patient's best interests. So before we delve into that, I, I want to make sure we are all on the same page. So I want to talk a little bit about the different types of umbrellas that are there, the different insurance covers we want to talk about. And then I want to talk about insurance as a platform for the doctor-patient relationship. And I want also to, to talk a little bit about how insurance may, may lead to interesting ethical questions in, in various scenarios. And I want to eventually talk a little bit about uh, the, the uh, ethical uh, issues that may arise in particular scenarios that are uh, related to insurance covers and terms and conditions of insurance policies. And I won't have any questions, but I have certainly, uh, I won't have any answers, really good answers, but I certainly have a few questions at the end of my presentation. I know we're a bit behind time, so I will go through it quite quickly, which is not too difficult because a lot of issues have been raised already by the previous speakers. So the insurance covers that are particularly relevant to the patient-doctor relationship uh, are 
what I call living benefits. We, in insurance, we, we divide between the mortality benefits, so the, the money that is paid when someone dies, as opposed to living benefits where the beneficiary is the insured. The insured person also receives the benefit, directly or indirectly, of the cover. A key element is medical insurance. Now, you would probably think that medical insurance is not so relevant in, in, uh, an organ, uh, in, in a healthcare system like Hong Kong, because we have basically a free healthcare system. But believe me, the, the public healthcare system and all the public healthcare systems around the world are basically unsustainable, and governments shift the responsibility and the activity to the private sector, meaning the private insurance covers. So more and more patients, and you as young students, you will see patients in ten year, five, ten years' time, many of them will have private insurance cover and basically only that. So medical reimbursement is when people are paid uh, money or their healthcare provider paid money when they have need medical care. They may have to pay a little bit extra out of pocket, not everything is covered, or up to a certain limit the insurance covers, but then they have excess and are, are, um, and are out of pocket. But then there are covers, quite expensive insurance covers, they paid simply as charged and just have limits. And here in Hong Kong, you, for example, you can buy insurance cover, medical reimbursement cover, that covers anything uh, that hospitals or doctors charge up to, say, $3 million a year. $3 million US dollars, that is, a year. So very generous covers. Uh, but some covers only, some of these reimbursement covers only allow people to go to hospitals. They would not reimburse um, um, outpatient, outpatient fees. So there are differences, and, and people can choose what they want. Um, there's another cover it's called hospital cash. Whenever you're hospitalized, for each day you're hospitalized, you get a certain amount of money, which covers the extra cost that you may have or the fact that you can't go to work at that time or you need to hire a helper for your children. And then very popular most recently is critical illness covers. They pay a lump sum when you have a catastrophic health event, when you have a heart attack or a stroke or are diagnosed with cancer. You get a lump sum that's been pre-agreed. You pay as premium, so a lump sum is being paid when this event happens. Then, and more recently, um, also uh, covers uh, came to the market that pay for cancer treatment. So you, you are diagnosed with cancer, but then you need cancer treatment. And these covers came about because it's quite obvious that modern treatment for cancer can be extremely expensive. Targeted treatment, immunotherapy for cancer is extremely expensive. And so insurance thought about solutions for these particular cases. Then there are covers uh, long-term care, not very popular, uh, but they are around where uh, if a person becomes impaired to a degree that they can't get out of bed, can't eat without assistance, cannot wash, and so on, um, then a lump sum payment or a kind of annuity is being paid uh, until the end of their care needs. And then there's disability cover. Disability means that you cannot return to work. Now, someone has to determine and certify that you cannot, or maybe can never, return to work. I don't want to talk, and that's why I put it in parentheses, about medical malpractice liability. First of all, I believe this is not really relevant a priori to the uh, relationship between a doctor and the patient, because it only comes into, uh, uh, comes into effect when the patient sues the doctor for negligent behavior, which I hope is not very common. So I want to talk about insurance cover as a facilitator, 
providing a platform for the doctor-patient relationship. On the patient side, it means that the patient can select maybe the healthcare provider, the hospital they want to go to, the doctor they want to see, because they have funds in their back, in the background. And they also don't need to think about money. And you can imagine when you have a serious sickness and you urgently want to see a doctor, the last thing you want to think about, can I finance it? Do I have the cash to, to pay for this? So insurance gives you that peace of mind, ideally. In an, ideally world, you, in an ideal world, you don't need to care about your financial situation because insurance takes care of that. And for the doctor, it's, it's also a positive platform, or can be, because he now can decide whatever is best for the patient, what is in the best patient's interest. If it's expensive, no problem. There is cover, there are funds available, made available through insurance, so the doctor can respond adequately to the case in front of him. And the insurance also sets some ground rules, which gives a bit of peace of mind. For example, only what is medically necessary will be reimbursed. So the, the patient knows only medically necessary things will be happening. And the doctor knows what the boundaries are. And also only approved forms of treatment, no experimental treatment will be covered. Fine, everybody knows, it sets its ground rules. So ideally then, insurance cover gives a platform, gives, facilitates a trust-driven, trust, trusting and confident environment. But if we take off these optimistic glasses, Quite frankly, insurance cover, cover does not address a vast array of, of issues. For example, what are the patient's expectations? What are their mindset? Have they Googled before they went there? Do they have certain preconceptions as to what they expect as forms of treatments or diagnostics? And they may ask for certain things to happen. And there's an American study saying, that 53% of doctors would yield to that and order unnecessary things because the patients ask them to do so. And the study concludes that really only if there's a trusting relationship between the doctor and the patient, they can do away with these unnecessary treatments or diagnostic uh, efforts. And then also, what, what is it the patient perceives as quality of life? What is their, their, what is their outcome? Their, what is their ideal out, outcome? And that can be different between doctor and so on. And also what, what the, the insurance cover usually do, does not address at all is how much time is spent in that doctor-patient relationship, their interaction. And we know this is a major problem all over. When we see a doctor, and I from time to time see a doctor, although I avoid it like Satan avoids garlic, uh, no time, right? Quick, quick, quick. Also, the right to be informed of the patient is often ne neglected and certainly not addressed by insurance cover. In fact, insurance cover kind of takes away a little bit of this confidentiality principle between the doctor and the patient because there's the third party, the insurer, and the insurer needs to be informed about the diagnosis, what has been done, what is planned. So there's a triangle instead of a mutual relationship, and, and that is probably not exactly helpful to the trust and then also, there's a notion that there's a lot of bureaucracy around a um, relationship when it, insurance comes into play, because the patient has to fill forms to get reimbursed, and the doctor has to fill forms to certify and also to get reimbursed eventually. Which means that instead of a trustful fiduciary relationship, it looks more like a contractual relationship. 
for possibly both the doctor and the patient. And as we heard from Dr. Campbell, I mean, there is never enough healthcare resource. And insurance with all these conditions and terms and condition probably reinforces that notion that healthcare has to be rationed, has to be uh, given in, in, in uh, has to, there's scarcity of healthcare resources and, and insurance facilitates that perhaps. And then it's also in, in the outpatient scenario, if there is insurance cover for outpatient, it's interesting. It's a lack of control or loss of control to a degree on both sides. The doctors are not controlled because they are not in a hospital system. And the patients, they are also not so easy to control because when they leave the rooms of the doctor, they go on their way home. They live their normal lives. They are not in a hospital setting and cannot be as well controlled. That is possibly one reason why most reimbursement covers do not include outpatient scenarios because the control factor is missing. And then I think one important point, and it's very close to my heart really, is, is that um, insurance covers do basically nothing to encourage preventative care efforts. They don't reimburse for that really. They don't incentivize the doctors to do so and they don't incentivize the patients to take care of their own health and their long-term outcomes. And then there is the, what I call the temptation. Their insurance provides incentives for people to do things they would usually not do if there wasn't insurance cover. For example, on the patient side, they may see the doctors more often than they really need to feel like because they have insurance cover to take care of the cost. If it was their own money, they wouldn't go. They wouldn't see the need. But because they have insurance cover, they go. They overutilize the system. And with some of these covers, for example, critical illness, I mentioned it before, critical illness may pay up to, say, 2 million US dollars if you are diagnosed with a certain disease. Wouldn't that be nice to get this money? Wouldn't you try to get there if you have paid premiums for many years now to get these two millions? So there's an incentive to push the boundaries from a, a patient's perspective. And from a doctor's perspective, well, for example, this patient could be treated in an outpatient setting, but the cover only covers hospitalization, so put them in the hospital, put them through the hospital, block a hospital bed for a night or two instead of doing an outpatient treatment because of the insurance cover that, that is in play. And then there's probably a temptation to do things beyond what is necessary because there's fund, there are funds available to pay for that. And then we talked about the doctor being an advocate for the patients, and of course, that's what we want. But where does advocacy end? Is advocacy just finding a, a maxim, maximum payout from the insurance? Is that really advocacy? Is that really in the interest of the insured or the insured population? There are lots of questions around that. And then I just want to mention it for, 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 um, to make sure we, we, we don't forget totally about, there are also insurance agents, right? These are the people who sell the insurance on behalf of the insurance company to a person who then becomes the insured. And when this person becomes a patient, insurance agents sometimes become quite active to liaise between patients and doctors and, and facilitate this process. And they then often work clearly as a maximizer of payouts to the doctors, to the insured. 
So yeah, it's complicated. And it's, it's particularly complicated, and this is kind of the flip side of someone being insured and creating this scenario of temptation, is when the people are not insured or underinsured, don't have enough insurance cover. So what are we doing with these people? And firstly, we should ask ourselves, why are they not insured? Many people just cannot afford private insurance. Others don't believe in it or don't care, are a bit negligent about it, cavalier about it. Or others just cannot buy insurance cover. And these are often people who had already a serious health condition. If I had a heart attack at the age of 55, I could not go to ABC company down the road and say, I want health insurance cover. They would not give it to me. That's why I am out of pocket when I see a doctor. By the way, it's not me, right? I'm, I'm okay. And then when the, the patient has to pay out of pocket a lot of the, 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 the fees out of pocket, what are their demands? I have a notion that people who pay out of pocket have different demands as compared to people who have insurance payments coming from the background. When they have spent their own money, put out their own wallet and, and count the, 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 the notes, I think they have a different demand. They, they want to have better care, special care. So they create a different demand than people who are insured. So if someone is underinsured or non-insured, what is it then uh, about minimal care? And there are interesting, interesting articles. And if you're interested, read about the changes to the American healthcare system, the uh, Affordable Care Act, and what it means for doctors, how they react to that. It's very interesting stuff around there. What, then, because what, what is it, what defines minimal care? Who defines what is minimal care in a particular scenario? Very difficult question to, to answer. Because obviously there are, as we heard in the, in the three previous uh, uh, presentations, there are moral and there are legal obligations to do things. Now I want to really briefly talk about specials. Most insurance um, covers have waiting periods. So you buy the cover, but only a couple of months later or even half a year later, you are able to claim under this cover. And this, the idea is that people don't, shouldn't buy insurance when they're already sick, right? When they then fall sick, this is what insurance is there for, for an unforeseeable event. But if it's foreseeable, uh, then not. So, so there's, there's, there are these waiting periods. There's a huge temptation. If someone falls sick, in the first three months while this waiting period is in place for the doctor to change the date a little bit to make sure there's a payout. It's very tempting, very tempting, and we've seen these cases. The other thing is contestability. Contestability is, uh, comes into play uh, where the insurance company can reject to pay a claim because they can prove that the person has non-disclosed a relevant fact. For example, someone has non-disclosed the fact that he has hypertension. When he applied for an insurance cover, he got the insurance cover. A year later, he has a stroke. And we as clinicians will all say, there is a nexus, right, between the hypertension and the stroke. Very likely, there is a nexus. There's a causal effect. Now, I've seen doctors arguing that very strongly, that there's no way we can in any way prove the nexus between this person having hypertension for many years and then having a stroke. Because if, if we cannot prove that, then the insurance company has to pay. So there's a temptation to get into very interesting uh, medical arguments. Another one is around terminal illness. There is a special uh, coverage under critical illness, usually, that pays out 
a lump sum, a, a amount of money, if, the patient, if a doctor certifies that the person will not survive for longer than six months. Now, all the physicians in this room will agree that this is usually a very difficult call to make. How long will people live? When it comes to two, three weeks, we're better, right? But to say someone will not survive the next six months because of a advanced disease is a difficult one to make. And doctors have to have, are usually asked to make that call. Now, we all know that the end-of-life care is the most expensive part for healthcare systems or for any, any, any in healthcare in the life of a person. The last two years is probably 80% of all the costs incurred during the lifetime. Now, um, if there's insurance cover for that, that's fine, but you wonder how much should be really spent at the end of the life uh, when there's no hope for recovery, how much money should be spent at that point in time. It's a, it's a very, um, very deep, I believe, a ethical question, and so is um, the, the suicide clause um, and the low success rate of insurance, uh, so, um, sorry, of, of medical treatment. I mentioned before that these new covers now come into the market that, that pay for very expensive cancer care. Now, when you read the studies about some of these products, some of these uh, immunotherapies or so, they're also not exactly curative, but they may extend the life expectancy of a person with advanced cancer from three to six months. Is that really what these funds should be spent on? I mean, yes, perhaps, but is it really what is, is the most useful, useful uh, utilization of these funds? An interesting one is the suicide clause. Um, so if w you buy life insurance cover, you will find that there is a term in the, the cover that you have to sign that if you co commit suicide within the first year, in other countries it's two years, sometimes it's three years, if you commit suicide in that time, only the premium that you've paid until then will be refunded, but the insurance benefit will not be paid out. I think it's quite logical, the, the ratio, rationale behind that is quite okay, People should not buy cover and jump out of the window. And the money is made available to their kin. So, um, yet, um, there's more and more discussion about physician-assisted suicide, which is, a, if you like, a hastening of death, a, a ending of suffering. I don't know where exactly the, the discussion is in Hong Kong, but worldwide this is being discussed as, as something. And, and, and although uh, the World Medical Association has a strict view on it, uh, that medical assisted suicide should not be performed, um, I think in some, some legislation it is coming into play. Now, if we have a suicide clause and in that time this person is desperately ill, begs for being, uh, having his life, his or her life ended, and the doctor complies with it, is he then incurring this clause, the suicide clause, which means no payout? I think it's just an interesting question, probably a bit academic, but I believe something in the larger scale will be, will be, uh, have an effect on um, the doctor and patient relationship. So, I said before, I don't have intelligent answers, and maybe even these questions are not very intelligent, but, but I, I'm wondering whether we need a few rules around the doctor-patient relationship in the context, in the context of insurance coverage. 
Currently, there are no rules around this. I looked it up, certainly not in, in the code of conduct in Hong Kong, certainly not in the code of conduct of the uh, World Medical Association. But then if we, if we followed through this concept or, or pursued this idea, who would set the rules? Would it be the doctors? Would it be the insurance companies? Would it be academics? Would it be, and it's probably more likely, a large committee, uh, a large multidisciplinary committee to come up with these rules? But now, if we then have these guidelines, a code of conduct around insurance, are we sure it will really do the trick and, and improve, have a positive effect on the patient-doctor relationship? Who knows? And even if it has, will it be able to improve outcomes, clinical outcomes of patients? Because that is the ultimate goal, isn't it? And then I come back to what I mentioned is very close to my heart because I believe for preventative medicine, preventative care, there's huge demand. There's huge demand, in particular in what some people call the silver tsunami that we're facing, right? With a massively, quickly aging population with very significant societal changes and an ever-increasing medical inflation, this tsunami to face that, I believe preventative care should be much more closer to our hearts than it currently is. There's massive demand and very little activity in this space. Now, I believe preventative care is at the core of a doctor's duty. Preventative care is also at the core of the interest of the patient every individual. And preventative care is also in the interest of the insurance companies because they only pay out if the person falls sick. When we can avoid that, it's a real win-win-win situation. And I believe we should ask the question whether there's room for collaboration between the various stakeholders. So thank you very much. Please.